there. Welcome back to the textbook of echocardiography. This module is going to discuss about the various forms of right ventricular outflow tract obstructions starting from valvar pulmonary stenosis where we will show examples of pliable pulmonary valve and dysplastic pulmonary valve then pulmonary atresia with intact ventricular septum this will be followed by subvalvar pulmonary narrowing namely infundibular pulmonary stenosis and double chambered right ventricle and then we'll go on to supravalvar pulmonary stenosis where stenosis of main pulmonary artery or branch pulmonary artery or distal peripheral post hilar pulmonary arteries are stenosed a subcostal short axis view of a patient with valvar pulmonary stenosis shows the dooming pulmonary valve the normal wide open right ventricular outflow tract below the pulmonary valve and a postenotic dilatation of the main pulmonary artery on using color doppler interrogation we are able to appreciate the turbulence of blood flow beyond the pulmonary valve we can also appreciate that there is no pulmonary regurgitation in most of the patients with valvar pulmonary stenosis in the early stages the right ventricular systolic function is well preserved so the right atrium and right ventricle are not dilated in this epical view we can appreciate a normal sized right ventricle and on an anterior sweep we can identify the right ventricular outflow tract and the doming pulmonary valve when we use a color doppler interrogation in the same epical view we can notice that there is no tricuspid regurgitation the right ventricular contractility is good and there is a turbulence across the pulmonary valve on an anterior sweep on a parasternal long axis sweep after we visualize the left ventricle and the aortic valve if you make a left towards sweep we will be able to open out the right ventricular outflow tract pulmonary valve and the main pulmonary artery we can appreciate the dooming pulmonary valve in this view again on a continuous color wave doppler interrogation we can notice the turbulence beyond the pulmonary valve and the doming nature of the pulmonary valve using a spectral doppler interrogation we can assess the severity of the pulmonary stenosis here we have a pulmonary stenosis gradient exceeding 100 mm of mercury which would qualify for a severe valvar pulmonary stenosis on a frozen systolic frame of the long axis of the outflow tract we can measure the pulmonary annulus from the hinge points of the pulmonary valve the doming of the pulmonary valve indicates that the valve leaflets are pliable and the mechanism of stenosis is due to commissural fusion in this magnified right ventricular outflow tract view which is obtained from the parasternal long axis we can notice a good pliable doming pulmonary valve these pliable pulmonary valves with good doming characteristics will have an excellent result after a balloon dilatation on a color doppler interrogation we can appreciate an extremely narrow jet of anti grade flu through the doming pulmonary valve indicating the severity of the pulmonary stenosis in this example we can find that there is a doming which indicates valvar pulmonary stenosis however the orifice seems to be larger and there is mild pulmonary valvar stenosis the turbulence across the pulmonary valve is confirmed by using color doppler interrogation on a continuous wave doppler we can notice that there is a mean gradient of 19 mm of mercury and peak gradient of 39 mm of mercury 
Whenever the pulmonary stenosis gradient is less than 25 millimeters of mercury, it is qualified as mild valvular pulmonary stenosis. A gradient between 25 to 50 millimeters of mercury will be classified under moderate valvular pulmonary stenosis. And a gradient exceeding 50 millimeters of mercury will be qualifying under severe pulmonary stenosis. In valvular pulmonary stenosis, whenever there is a pliable pulmonary valve with doming characteristics due to the post-stenotic dilatation, there is an enlarged main pulmonary artery and proximal left pulmonary artery. However, this dilatation of the main pulmonary artery and left pulmonary artery is not seen in patients who have dysplastic pulmonary valve. Dysplastic pulmonary valves are valves which have thickened nodular leaflets which cause the pulmonary stenosis and there is very minimal commissural fusion. These valves do not yield well to balloon dilatation and the pulmonary stenosis often persists after balloon dilatation. In this Parasternal short axis view, we can appreciate thick and nodular pulmonary valve tissues and there is no doming of the pulmonary valve. We can notice the color turbulence beyond the pulmonary valve in systole and we can also notice that there is a mild pulmonary regurgitation. Most of the dysplastic pulmonary valves will have some degrees of regurgitation also. One indirect way of assessing the severity of pulmonary stenosis will be to assess the flow patterns if there is an associated ventricular septal defect. In this patient with valvular pulmonary stenosis and an apical muscular ventricular septal defect, we can appreciate a complete right to left shunt from the right ventricle to left ventricle in systole, which indicates that the right ventricular systolic pressure is at least equal to the left ventricular systolic pressure. In this second example of a patient with valvular pulmonary stenosis and a perimembranous ventricular septal defect, the epical fourth chamber view initially starts showing the ventricular septal defect with a left to right laminar flow. And on an anterior sweep, we can appreciate the turbulence across the pulmonary valve. We explained about Grading the severity of pulmonary stenosis as mild, moderate and severe depending on the gradients of 25 millimeters of mercury, 50 millimeters of mercury and above. Pulmonary stenosis is named critical if there are few echocardiographic features. In this example, there is severe right ventricular systolic dysfunction and marked dilatation of the right atrium and right ventricle. When pulmonary stenosis is associated with right ventricular systolic dysfunction, it is considered critical. Similarly, when there is a severe tricuspid regurgitation which reduces the effective cardiac output, it is again considered critical. In these patients with critical valvular pulmonary stenosis, we can notice that the subvalvar right ventricular infundibulum is dilated and ballooned out. The pulmonary annulus and pulmonary arteries are measured. We can notice that the pulmonary annulus is hypoplastic. Whenever the pulmonary stenosis gradient exceeds 100 to 120 millimeters of mercury, the right ventricle is likely to be suprasystemic. Pulmonary stenosis is also considered critical if there is a severe hypoxia due to right to left shunt through the patent for Amanovale. This can be confirmed from subsified view when we interrogate the intraatrial septum and notice a right to left shunt through the patent for Amanovale. We can magnify the atrial septum in the subsified view 
to clearly appreciate the right left flows through the foramen ovale. In patients with pulmonary stenosis, the right ventricle is significantly hypertrophy and with advancing age, the right ventricular systolic contractility becomes less. Very often, when there is a right ventricular systolic dysfunction due to ventricular interdependence, there is also an associated left ventricular systolic dysfunction. The right ventricle can get markedly hypertrophy. We can appreciate in this epical view the free wall of the right ventricle is much more thicker than the free wall of the left ventricle. When the right ventricular systolic pressure becomes suprasystemic, we can notice the intraventricular septum bulging into the cavity of the left ventricle. In these patients, we can measure the right ventricular systolic pressure by using continuous wave Doppler on the tricuspid regurgitation jet. Whenever the right ventricular systolic pressure reaches systemic or suprasystemic levels, beyond a certain age, the right ventricle starts to fail and there is right ventricular systolic dysfunction with resultant ventricular and atrial dilatation and coronary sinus dilatation. All failing right ventricles will have associated tricuspid regurgitation. The thickened hypertrophied right ventricle will also relax poorly and this will be shown as right ventricular diastolic dysfunction when we use the tricuspid valve inflow Doppler. Here we can notice that the A waves are taller than the E wave which indicates delayed relaxation pattern. When we look at the inferior vena cable and hepatic venous flows, we can notice that there is a significant atrial systolic flow reversals in the hepatic veins. The flow reversal in atrial systole into the hepatic veins can also be appreciated by using pulse wave Doppler in the hepatic veins. We can notice that there is a prominent atrial systolic reversals measuring up to 1 meter per second which indicates very significant atrial systolic reversal. A majority of right ventricular outflow tract obstruction are at valvar level. However, one-fourth of patients with RVOT obstruction will have severe infundibular pulmonary stenosis. In this parasternal long axis view, we can appreciate the marked hypertrophied infundibulum with a narrow infundibular cavity and a normal pulmonary valve beyond the level of infundibular narrowing. On using a color flow Doppler, we can appreciate the color turbulence across the narrowed infundibulum. From the subsified short axis view, the severe narrowing is noticed in the subvalvar infundibular area. Again, we can use the continuous wave Doppler to assess the severity of infundibular stenosis. Some patients with infundibular pulmonary stenosis may have associated valvar doming as well. In this color Doppler examination from the parasternal echo window, we can notice a doming pulmonary valve, a postgenotic dilatation of the main pulmonary artery. However, there is a significant infundibular narrowing as well. In valvar pulmonary stenosis, if they are remaining uncorrected over a long period of time, there will be a secondary infundibular right ventricular hypertrophy, which also will contribute to the infundibular narrowing. Double chambered right ventricle is a morphological entity where there is a marked hypertrophy of the septal band which partitions the right ventricle into a chamber involving the right ventricular inflow and epical portion and a chamber that involves the right ventricular outflow or infundibulum. In this parasternal short axis view, we can notice a marked hypertrophy of the septal band that causes a severe subinfundibular RVOT narrowing. 
transesophageal echocardiogram, we can appreciate the right ventricular inflow and the right ventricular outflow with a subinfundibular severe narrowing. We can notice that the pulmonary valve is normal and there is a well-formed infundibular chamber. On a subsifoid short axis view, once again we can notice the double chambered right ventricle with a right ventricular body and a right ventricular outflow tract. In this subsifoid short axis view, the distal infundibular cavity is measured to be about 1.6 centimeters. A well formed distal infundibular chamber is the feature of double chambered right ventricle. On a subsifoid short axis view, we can notice the turbulence caused by the hypertrophied septal band, which is seen in the subinfundibular region. After discussion on valvar and subvalvar pulmonary stenosis, let us move on to supravalvar pulmonary stenosis. In this subsifoid short axis view, we can notice the open right ventricular outflow tract, the normal opening of the pulmonary valve. However, immediately above the pulmonary valve, there is a severe MPA narrowing. The parasternal long axis view, which opens out the entire right ventricular outflow tract on a left towards sweep, shows the normal open infundibulum. The pulmonary valve also functions normally. However, there is a supravalve or main pulmonary artery narrowing. When we magnify on the region of supravalve or pulmonary stenosis, we can find that this is a discrete membranous obstruction which is circumferential from all the walls of the proximal main pulmonary artery. Similar to a supravalvar aortic stenosis, a supravalvar pulmonary stenosis can have a hover glass constriction, a diffuse tubular narrowing, or rarely a discrete membranous obstruction. In some patients, there will be a combination of valvar and supravalvar pulmonary stenosis, we can appreciate a doming pulmonary valve and in association there is a supravalvar main pulmonary artery narrowing. MPS stenosis sometimes can be found in the mid or distal portions. In this parasternal short axis view, magnified view, we can appreciate distal main pulmonary artery type stenosis. Pulmonary artery stenosis may involve one or both branch pulmonary arteries. We can appreciate the bilateral pulmonary artery turbulence in this patient. However, the left pulmonary artery is more involved than the right pulmonary artery. The left pulmonary artery origin measures only 2.7 millimeters. Such peripheral pulmonary artery stenosis can be seen in Noonan syndrome rubella syndrome and allegilla syndrome. When there is an unilateral pulmonary artery stenosis, we need to clearly get a Doppler gradients through the stenosis. In spite of very severe stenosis, unilateral pulmonary arteries will give gradients less than 50 millimeters of mercury. This is because of redistribution of the blood flows to the other lungs. This is an example of a tight right pulmonary artery stenosis with dilated left pulmonary artery. We can notice that the right pulmonary artery narrow narrowing is primarily involving the ostium and the mediastinal portions and the hilar pre-branching right pulmonary artery is better developed. On a Doppler assessment of the right pulmonary artery gradient, we are noticing a peak systolic pressure of 96 millimeters of mercury. Whenever a patient with unilateral pulmonary artery stenosis is having a gradient of more than 50 millimeters of mercury, it is an indicator that 
there is a distal narrowing in the contralateral pulmonary artery also. With unilateral pulmonary artery stenosis, there is a complete redistribution of the pulmonary blood flows into the other lung. So there will never be a marked elevation of the proximal main pulmonary artery and right ventricular systolic pressures. If the pulmonary artery stenosis gradient is exceeding 50 millimeters of mercury, this is a very clear indicator that the pulmonary arteries on both sides are significantly narrowed. Let us see one such example of distal severe peripheral pulmonary artery stenosis. We can appreciate a marked right ventricular hypertrophy on this apical view. The right ventricular systolic contractility is reasonably well preserved and there is mild right atrial dilatation which may be caused by right ventricular diastolic dysfunction. On a continuous wave Doppler interrogation of the tricuspid regurgitation jet the predicted right ventricular systolic pressure is more than 150 millimeters of mercury. On a parasternal short axis view, we can notice the hypertrophied right ventricle and the interventricular septum is moving into the left ventricle, indicating that the right ventricular systolic pressure is higher than the left ventricular systolic pressure. When we interrogate the pulmonary regurgitation jet, we find the peak pulmonary regurgitation velocity of 4.7 meter per second which gives a peak gradient of 89 millimeters of mercury. This is an indicator of a pulmonary artery mean pressure. This patient did not have any gradient that was appreciated in the mediastinal and hilar portions of the pulmonary artery on echocardiogram. However, on a CT pulmonary angiogram, there was a very distal post hilar pulmonary artery narrowing and she underwent bilateral post hilar pulmonary artery stenting. Following the pulmonary artery stenting, we can appreciate that the right ventricular hypertrophy is persisting. However, the right ventricular systolic contractility is even better than the pre-procedural RV function. The peak pulmonary regurgitation gradients, which are originally 89 millimeters of mercury, drop down to 21 millimeters of mercury, which indicates near normal pulmonary artery pressures. In neonates, sometimes there can be mild flow acceleration in the branch pulmonary arteries and they may not indicate significant peripheral pulmonary artery stenosis. We can get gradients of up to 20 to 30 millimeters of mercury in this neonates without any functional significance. A pulse wave Doppler on the left pulmonary artery origin shows a peak gradient of 21 millimeters of mercury in this instance. On the right pulmonary artery, a pulse wave Doppler shows a peak gradient of around 15 millimeters of mercury. Pulmonary atresia with intact ventricular septum is an extreme form in the spectrum of pulmonary stenosis. It can be membranous or muscular atresia of the right ventricular outflow tract with intact ventricular septum. The condition often presents with a duct dependent pulmonary circulation and the pulmonary arteries are usually confluent and well formed. The right ventricle can either be very hypoplastic with a small tricuspid annulus or Rarely it may be dilated and dysfunctional with severe tricuspid regurgitation and aneurysmal dilatation of the right atrium. Some patients may have RB dependent coronary circulation with myocardial sinusoids and this will be an adverse prognostic factor. Epical four chamber view of pulmonary atresia with intact ventricular septum shows a small tricuspid annulus a markedly hypertrophied right ventricle with a small right ventricular cavity 
immobile tricuspid valve leaflets indicating some sort of dysplasia of the tricuspid valve. On color flow Doppler interrogation, we can notice that there are some color flows within the right ventricular cavity and they form myocardial sinusoids and there are also dilated epicardial coronary vessels over the surface of the right ventricle. On a subsified short axis view, we can notice a well formed left ventricular cavity, hypoplastic right ventricle and a valvar pulmonary atresia with a well formed main pulmonary artery. On a color flow interrogation in the same subsified short axis view, we can appreciate the continuous flows through the patent ductus arteriosus into the main pulmonary artery, a valvar pulmonary atresia and a markedly hypoplastic right ventricle. Some patients with pulmonary atresia intact ventricular septum can have a dilated dysfunctional right ventricle a tethered dysplastic tricuspid valve with severe tricuspid regurgitation. We can appreciate in this epical view a marked dilatation of the right atrium and tethering of the tricuspid valve leaflets which causes a central regurgitant orifice that can be appreciated on two dimensional echocardiogram. These patients with pulmonary atresia, intact ventricular septum and dilated right ventricle will often have substantial tricuspid regurgitation and aneurysmal dilatation of the right atrium. On a short axis view from the subsified plane, we can appreciate a dilated right ventricle. However, the intraventricular septum is flat indicative of similar pressures in the right ventricle and left ventricle. On a parasternal short axis view, we can appreciate the right ventricular hypertrophy and dilatation of the right ventricle. On parasternal short axis view, the membranous valve or atresia is well appreciated. The right pulmonary artery and left pulmonary artery, even though they are hypoplastic, do not have any discrete areas of stenosis. On a color flow interrogation, we can notice a continuous color flow into the main pulmonary artery through the patent ductus arteriosus. All patients with pulmonary atresia intact ventricular septum will have a duct dependent pulmonary circulation. On a suprasternal view, we can notice the patency of the ductus arteriosus, which is the lifeline for these patients. Some of these ductus can arise from the undersurface of the aortic arch and have a vertical or tortuous course like tetralogy. On an apical four chamber view, we can appreciate the hypoplastic right ventricle having multiple sinusoids with color filling them from the epicardial surface of the right ventricle, indicative of right ventricle dependent coronary circulation. When we look at the aortic root on parasternal short axis, we can notice an accelerated coronary flow and also a to and fro coronary flow in systole and diastole, which is indicative of myocardial sinusoids communicating with the coronary arteries and a possibility of a right ventricle dependent coronary circulation. The management of pulmonary atresia with intact ventricular septum will be a provision of a reliable source of pulmonary blood flow in the neonatal period. The management strategy will depend on the adequacy of the right ventricle as assessed by the tricuspid valve Z score. The immediate neonatal options will be pulmonary valvotomy with or without performance of an iotopulmonary shunt or a ductal stenting. Later they are managed by either a biventricular root, one and a half ventricle root or a single ventricle repair depending on the adequacy of the right ventricle 
the z square of the tricuspid valve and presence or absence of right ventricle dependent coronary circulation this is a suprasternal still frame showing the tortuous ductus arteriosus the entire length of the ductus is measured before a ductal stenting as the ductal stent needs to cover the entire length of the ductus the stent length should be marginally be longer than the ductal length before a ductal stenting the branch pulmonary arteries are also carefully analyzed to avoid patients who have stenosis of the origins of the pulmonary arteries this is a ductal view that shows the flows from the aorta into the pulmonary artery following a ductal stent a parasternal short axis view after the ductal stent will show a continuous flow through the ductal stent into the branch pulmonary arteries we can appreciate the cross section of the ductal stent and a continuous flow into the left pulmonary artery from the ductal stent on a suprasternal long axis view of the aortic arch we notice that the stent doesn't have too much of protrusion into the aorta a continuous wave doppler through the ductal stent will show a continuous flow from the aorta into the main pulmonary artery in some patients who have a valvular pulmonary atresia if the pulmonary stenosis persists due to narrow annulus they will need a stenting of the right ventricular outflow tract to open the region of the pulmonary annulus in this example the right ventricular outflow tract has been stented following a balloon pulmonary valvotomy and we can see the two and fro flows caused by the free pulmonary regurgitation on an apical view on an anterior sweep we can appreciate the right ventricle to pulmonary artery communication through the rvot stent to summarize the common form of right ventricular outflow tract narrowing is valvular pulmonary stenosis dysplastic pulmonary valves do not dome well and are not associated with any postenotic pa dilatation subvalvar narrowing can be seen in about 1/4 of the patient and can involve the infundibulum or sometimes be located at a much lower plane in the subinfundibular region and present as double chambered right ventricle supravalvar narrowing of the pulmonary artery can occur from proximal main pulmonary artery to post hilar branch pulmonary arteries pulmonary atresia with intact ventricular septum is an extreme form in the spectrum of pulmonary stenosis